So this picture that you're seeing right now is a photo of Noam Chomsky smoking in 1969 at MIT. Hello everyone, welcome back to Spar and Brawl. Hope you're having a good day. As always, I'm joined by my co-host Sam. But yeah, Sam, I had never seen this Noam Chomsky photo before and there's only like one set or album of them and most of them belong to Getty Images, I believe. So I don't even know if it's real, if he used to smoke the pipe or they did some kind of cool photo shoot and they asked him to smoke because I haven't found any other photos of him smoking even back in the day. Have you yeah. ever cr- come across any? No, and I I hadn't seen this picture, but yeah. it, it is the coolest picture of Chomsky. <laughs> I would say it's like, you know, he's thinking and the yeah. pipe and all that. Yeah, it, he looks like a real radical there. So that's a yeah. nice one. Man, do you know how old Chomsky is now? I would imagine in the 80s, right? I don't know. He's 92. Jesus, wow. Yeah. He's a... And he was born in 1928, I believe. Oh, wow. Right after, like, yeah, four or five years after yeah. World War I. That's crazy. So anyway, I've been watching a lot of Noam Chomsky videos recently, and I came across some of his linguistic stuff, which I have no expertise on, neither do you, but, I mean, maybe know a little bit through Noam Chomsky, maybe read stuff, so full disclosure. But I found some of the stuff that he said interesting, yeah. so we're just going to talk about that. So we're going to talk about two things his universal Mm -hmm. language grammar thing, and the other one, which is more social, and that's about nationalism. But, so Sam, what is, like, maybe you can explain better, then I'll try to fill in the gaps with what I've heard. But what is Chomsky's, like, universal grammar or theory of language? And that's apparently what he's most famous for, right? In, like, his scholarly work. Well, he, that's his most, I guess, scientific work in yeah. a way. It's more hard sciences rather than political sciences that is, he's probably more famous for. But uh, in since basically 1960s, um, there are if, even before there are two, uh, there are different schools regarding the origins of the language, and it's fascinating stuff, and it's one of those things that you can lose a day or two. In, Tell uh, me about Wikipedia, it. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, and Wikipedia and YouTube basically about. But there are a group of the, the radical behavior. People are obviously on the spectrum. Nobody's hundred percent this or that. But there are people who are behaviorists and radical behaviorists, like a Skinner, who believe that all language is basically taught. It's a result of uh, you know we you see external stimulus, right? It's it's again through seeing and repeating other people and all. Other people, uh, including Chomsky, who, uh, like, I believe he became famous originally for this, believe that there is a biological uh, underpinning, that's the best way of putting it, underpinning to the way we speak. Because, to be honest, I don't really truly understand Chomsky's theory, because sometimes when I read about it, it seems to suggest there is a specific... Uh, part of our brain but some other times it's sort of a process uh, that involves different parts it's so i don't understand that uh, if he's referring to a specific uh, part of brain that creates this functionality for humanity and uh, uh, again this is something that i'm personally more on the behaviorist type of thing i just think we have a more enhanced version of what animals have but Chomsky seems to suggest that no, it's because of uh, it's because uh, there is something innately and biologically within a human uh, yeah. uh, in humans. Uh, he comes apparently his theory comes f- more from the rationalist, uh, you know, way of thinking and ideology. But empiricists who focus on evidence obviously tend to more go towards the whole behaviorist and. Um, you know, uh, the theory that you learn languages rather than there is an innate biological underpinning to it. So that's a basic overview. And then, yeah, he comes, Chomsky comes out with a scientific study that, you know, promotes his views and uh, comes up with the concept of universal grammar, which has its supporters and proponents and all that. Uh, there is a that's I mean as you mentioned again disclaimer we are not experts on linguistics but it's just something that you know I find fascinating and as you know I'm a 
uh, I teach English as well. But, uh, but the, one of the things I read, uh, his argument is underlined by the concept of poverty of a stimulus. So Chomsky says that there is relative poverty of a stimulus for a child to develop a sophisticated language that it develops by the age two or three, right? Uh, it's, it's, so, it's, oh, sorry, sorry, so, sorry, sorry. So that means that poverty of stimulus means that there's no way that child he means would have heard all the things that he's saying oh. already at the age of eight. Or, be, yeah, or the child is not told grammar. Or no, mm-hmm. no, none of us are taught our, uh, our, our mother tongue's grammar. We just pick it up, right? And he argues, and many others, that there's a parity of a stimulus. I've read articles that actually, and I personally disagree with that. I, I mean, I just go by anecdotal evidence, but there are scientific uh, uh, academic papers that do argue against that, that there is a parity of a stimulus. I mean, especially in these days with technology, television, and all that, my young nephew, for example, a, a lot of children, I think if anything, it's over, uh, it, there is over, uh, <laughs> there, there's so much a stimulus that, yeah. you know, uh, it's it's crazy. Uh, but at any rate, uh, yeah, that's, that's basically some of the things I know about Chomsky's uh, mm. theory of linguistic. Obviously, there is a, a hell of a lot more and it's all more detailed and I just gave a simplistic view so yeah re- read up on that on yourself no that's fascinating I've been like into this for a week or two now as well and my understanding is kind of what you said too but what you were saying about the behavioralist is kind of interesting if you think about it more of a social science way so these behavioralist people were more constructivist actually in the way in a way whereas Chomsky is a bit more of a positivist in some way in the way that he sees it but he says I mean, some interesting yeah if you look at Chomsky's issues with the Slavoj Zizek the, okay uh, yeah I'm not too familiar with that but I know who you're talking about they have major disagreements as well even though they pretty much perhaps a lot of times a lot of people who are you know people are fan of both of them but they mm-hmm. differ fundamentally on the ontological and if it, you know they differ on methodology so yeah Ch- chomsky is generally even though he's a leftist in many ways he's a uh, he's closer to positivists in you know a lot of times than your usual lefty constructivist type figure. yeah i mean yeah he says a few interesting things though in support but yeah so from what i understood too so like your brain already pretty much has like just like, I don't know how you know how to walk or something, I guess, after, I don't, I mean, but yeah, it has a grammar in it, in his, in the, in the head, really, in your head. And that's why he says, I guess, most languages around the world have relatively similar structures. And then he also goes to say that the language that you learn, I guess this can go to both arguments. So he's like, the language that you know, you just pick it up. And he's like, you just put a kid anywhere in any environment He'll pick up the language just as he will continue to grow. And then he says that the language that they teach you at school and stuff. I'm not going to get into the second part of the argument. still read the first one. So the reason that they have to teach you is because it's fake. It's artificial. And that's why you make mistakes. And that's why kids don't make the mistakes that you expect them to make. Because that's natural. But when you teach stuff that are, you know that we've built as, you know, rules, language rules, which have nothing to do with that, you know, some person likes saying it this way or that way. That's why you have to teach those. And, you know, how in most schools, the literary language I teach you is complete or very different in some countries than the language that you just naturally pick up, which is much closer to, I guess, that natural kind of language in your head. But yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I pulled a few things that he said, like I just mentioned, he says what you're being taught in school is false because, I mean, it's like a made-up language and thing that they're teaching to you. And he says your actual language, nobody teaches you. And then he goes on to say, yeah, if you just stick a kid in any environment, they'll pick up the language, which I guess can be lent to both sides of the argument. Yes, that's, yeah, that, that's true. I mean, where he's definitely right is basically that language is not a... Uh, because 
you know, there are no rules to the language. There are no, you know, nobody from a sky or uh, anywhere, or there is no scientific rules. It's Except, I guess he will say the language. universal grammar rules. Grammar. He would yeah. say a yeah, universal, yeah, yeah. But besides that, it's uh, something that is extremely flexible and has been changed according to geographical region and need and necessity and all that. And it's something that... Uh, yeah, I mean, this is we are veering off into the second. Yeah, part second argument. Yeah, probably. but yeah, Eric Hobsbawm, Benedict Anderson, people who talk about nationalism and you know creation of nation state or creation of a, na- a single community. Language is always a big part of that. Newspapers, televisions, things that lead to a more uniform form of language, basically. Yeah. And I mean, so let's just segue into the second one because I don't have much else to add and the yeah. other stuff that we learned. Mm-hmm. This is much more in our alleyway, which makes complete sense and everything. I mean, of course, then we didn't hear, need Chomsky to say this, but which is that, you know, the link between national languages and nation building and how we forget that, you know, all these kind of languages and we think they're set in stone and this is the right language and how it's been. You just have to go back like a hundred years and you'll see the you'll see how it was in the case. And then he points some very like easy examples. You know, he points in places like Italy, where a few hundred years ago, people in North and South could barely understand each other. And he says the language that it, you know as Italian was the Italy that was spoken in Florence. And, you know, usually the language that you're taught in school is like pretty much whatever language has w- won all the, you know, cultural, social wars, like Position. everything else. Yeah, the, yeah, the ones that control newspapers yeah. and media basically set the course, and education system yeah. set the course. But, but uh, um, Germany is still doesn't have, I think, single unified. German language is still going through the process of yeah. uniformification. Bavarian is somewhat. Like, yeah, yeah, he uh, gives the Germany uh, example, and then the, yeah. the clearest it, one is China. He says, like, what we call Chinese dialects. He says, like, one Chinese dialect from another is as different as. French is to German and these are just like a social cultural definition and like grouping that we've given to all these yeah yeah Yeah. no that's definitely yeah yeah it's very much for on this matter though I would suggest reading uh, uh, Eric Hobsbawm's history as well as uh, Benedict Anderson's uh, imagined communities they are great on the role that um, language unification plays in nationalization and na- nation state creation and all that because nation states are relatively new right before then then we used to live in empires that were multilingual and multicultural mm-hmm. not necessarily more peaceful but you know more mixed yeah so, extremely uh, yeah. new i mean it's interesting how c- even countries such as france which compared to some african nations or middle eastern nations they became a country much more organically, you, you could say, perhaps. You just have to look at the map. But even there, I mean, there had to be a conscious attempt to, you know, have a unified language. But and it's France, just so funny but, with French because French has such a, like, you know... like France had the uh, most, uh, most radical reaction in terms of language because they created Académique Français or whatever mm-hmm. it's called that up with new words and... I mean, I think it's a bit of an overreaction to this language is always evolving and yeah, boring. Words and, of course, but yeah, the French but, are so like you know they, they like take pride on <laughs> pride on that, which I guess yeah, is all fake. And then and, I was just telling you this. Sorry, go ahead. For, in France, they had thousands of languages called mm-hmm. patios, I believe, that were sort of local languages. They basically destroyed those in favor of a centralized. Yeah, France really went crazy on the whole language thing. Yeah. But the whole thing of nation building is just fascinating, you know, and then people have because in our heads we're so programmed now, I guess, you know, to think, okay, these people are from this country. That means, you know, they're for sure unified across all these traits and characteristics in like an organic way, which often is, you know, far from the truth. And you need need all these things. And then he, he was pointing out such interesting things about language. It's the last thing I remember is I was telling you, he he says that how French, the old French was a proper, I mean, still is, but what's the word? Romance language? Romance language. language romance language. In vulgar Latin, basically, yeah. the Latin that most people have spoke. And he points out that how, like, in the, um, it's 
for instance, in actual Romance language or the other Romance languages, you can drop the subject so you don't have to say that like I want. You can just say want, which I've been learning Portuguese a bit and it clicked. I was like, shit, that's true. But you can't do it in French. And then he says that in French, this part of the rule, they just decided, you know, when they made this version of the French, whoever someone pushed it to be more like the English and German language, which you can't do that. Just fascinating stuff, really. Yeah, languages are mixed in very crazy and strange ways. English is a fascinating one because mm -hmm. it has the French, German, Latin, older Latin and uh, Scandinavian influence. It's, you know, there are loads of mixtures. Persian has... A, yeah, I was going to ask you, what about... for? I mean, for I, as I, a kid, like, I, 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 can, I find in Iran, it's very actually extreme. There's like, the in newspapers or on TV and stuff, it's as if they're often speaking a completely different language than the Farsi sure. that I would speak but, at home or like on the streets or whatever. It's like these Iran, fancy words or posh. I don't know what the story is. Yeah, it's far more, uh, yeah, it's written language. Although r newspaper written language is far more posher, as you say, or more formal. But you know, within Persian, there is less diversity than most languages, I think. And it's largely, I think, to do with the fact that Persian is very much poetry based. Mm. So the poetry, which had to be memorized, not, you know, people who couldn't read and write. So you don't get as many variants of, you, you know, the Persian dialects are sometimes difficult to understand, but they're not like sometimes, for example, it's not like the case that is in Italy with the North and yeah, South. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true Germany. when I think about it. But, yeah. but in Iran, you have multiple languages like mm -hmm. the Turkish and Persian, and then you got the Arabic. And then within Turkish, I think there is the most variety, for example, Turks from a certain city don't understand Turks from another city. Yeah. You know, but uh, within Persian, there is less. So largely yeah. because of its history, I think. So in each case, it's really different. No, yeah, I, I even, I particularly meant like in Persian, in Farsi. I know in Iran, they speak multiple languages. But yeah, like, so the literary one is quite different in Iran than too from the spoken one or no. Because I mean, Chomsky says, for instance, in English, it's not, which is so true. The English that you learn in school in the States or in the UK is relatively similar, similar to the English that, you're, that you would speak it's at it, home and pick up on the streets or whatever. It, it, it's changing now. It's getting more informal, like fictional books, novels, that type of thing. But newspapers are very, very, very formal. And in, and in Farsi and Iran, they also teach you two ways of writing, right? If I'm not mistaken. Like the way uh, that's written in like... <laughs> Uh, that's calligraphy. That's ca no, 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 no. The, okay. the way that's wrote, like in Farsi, when you speak, you eat a lot of your own words. Yeah, like, no, I'm uh, talking about the writing specifically. No, that, that's calligraphy, basically. In okay. Iran, back in the days, there used to be more, more emphasis on calligraphy, which they call nastaliq, which is if you look at Pakistani videos, for example, or Pakistani subtitles, the way Pakistanis write, mm. they write like nastaliq, which is a bit more like the way the words are written is more dragged and it's more connected the Persian one the one in Iran in use is more uh, sort of robotic and has more 90 degrees yeah. and all that so no no but that's calligraphy that's not mm -hmm. a uh, but in when we speak in Farsi it's for, far more relaxed when you read the informal thing everything is pronounced so mm -hmm. it feels we on newspapers, especially, not so much uh, like in fictional novels or in history books or, you know, in that type of thing. Okay, all right. Well, very interesting. I guess we'll end this Chomsky conversation here. Yeah. And it's actually raining New Year in a week, so we're going to be putting out some content specific to Iran. But, yeah, any final thoughts on languages, Chomsky? Chomsky smoking? <laughs> No. Is that it? Was Chomsky really a smoker or was it just for photo shoots? Someone and, needs to get to the bottom uh, of that. And what was in that pipe, you know? Yeah. Uh, weed, crack. Yeah. We need to know. We need the answers now, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let us yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for watching. Please share your thoughts, comments in the comment box below. And please like and subscribe. And we'll see you in our next video. Thank you.